We now turn to ambiguity. An ambiguous claim is a claim that can be interpreted in more than one way, and whose meaning is not made clear by the context. So a word, phrase, or sentence is ambiguous when it has more than one meaning. Now, going back to the notion of vagueness, we saw that vagueness is something that's not precise enough. And I drew a crappy analogy between vagueness and driving in the fog. Now, if being in vagueness is like being in a fog, ambiguity is like driving along a road that splits, but there are no signs, so you don't know which road is, is actually which. So you don't know which way to go. So the ambiguity, you have two or more possible meanings, and it's not clear which is intended. For example, if someone says, Paul cashed a check, that's ambiguous. Why? Well, this is kind of a boring example, but the idea is that one could cash a check, one could go to the bank and have the teller cash a check, or one could be the teller cashing the check. So it would be ambiguous. Or another example, if someone says, Jennifer is renting a house, once again, that could mean that she's the one paying rent, or it could mean that someone is paying her rent for her house. Now, ambiguous questions are, are such that if someone is clever, they can be exploited. For example, some years ago, uh, the noted uh, media person Russet was asking uh, Jonathan Edwards the question, why don't you support gay marriage? Now, of course, the question, why don't you support gay marriage, is ambiguous. It can be taken as meaning, you know, what are your logical reasons for being opposed to it? It could also be taken as a psychological question. Why do you not support this? You know, what are your psychological reasons? And Edwards answered, taking the, the easier way out, he said, well, I guess it was the way I was brought up. So if a question is ambiguous, one has potentially an out. Now, ambiguity can also lead to communication problems, even when people are actually intending to communicate clearly. For example, when we talk about the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on women, the war on this, the war on that, people you have you know, come to notice that the notion war is rather ambiguous. After all, we normally think of war as meaning, you know, like war like you know, World War One or World War Two. But we talk about things like the war on poverty or the war on crime or the war on women. They mean different things. Another example, when we talk about you know the matter of you know, freedom, or the right to freedom, like freedom of press, or freedom to bear arms. There's questions about ambiguity there as well. What is meant by those terms? Now, in order to have a rational discussion, one of the things that has to be settled is that ambiguous terms have to have their ambiguity removed. Now, we might not be able to achieve, obviously, perfect lack of ambiguity, but the idea is so that it's clear what is intended. Now, in addition to cases where people are being ambiguous in a way by accident, when they're not intending to, there are also cases when people can be ambiguous out of in intent. For example, some years ago, I noticed that there was a charge appearing on my credit card. It was basically credit card insurance, which I had neither ordered nor asked for nor wanted. So I called the credit card company you know, and spoke to the, sale, the rep and said, I'd like to cancel my credit card insurance. And the person very politely said, certainly, we'll send you a letter to sign to cancel it. And I said, can I just cancel it over the phone? And the person, you know, said back in a very pleasant tone, why, yes, yes, of course you can cancel over the phone. Now, I realized that was too easy. So, in this case, I realized, you know, having talked critical thinking for quite some time, I realized the term it was ambiguous. Because if I'd simply hung up at that point, what the person would have canceled is not the credit card insurance that I did not want, nor did I order, but would have canceled my request to cancel it. And so what I did is I you know, got involved with this person in a lengthy you know, conversation over this matter, and, and finally I said to him, I said, I want you to say, do you want to have your credit card insurance canceled? He's like, well, and I said, say it, say it. And so finally he said, do you want to have your credit card insurance canceled? I said, yes, thank you. Have a nice day. But of course, if I hadn't realized the ambiguity, 
I could have had to call back once again. So ambiguity can be used to dupe and confuse people. Now, ambiguity can also have various other serious implications. For example, as I record this, we're involved in the United States in a considerable debate and dispute, once again, over gun rights, with considerable attention, of course, being focused on the Second Amendment. Now, take the Second Amendment, or at least the, the critical part of it, which states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, in this case, there's an ambiguity there. Some people take this as a collective right, that is to say, that citizens, the people, have the right to be armed when serving in a militia. And of course, today we don't have you know, official militias, but what people often take this to mean is serving in, say, the National Guard, or even the military. Others, of course, take this not to be a collective right, but an individual right. That is to say, it's not the case that collectively we have the right to be armed, but that individually, that each citizen has the right to bear his or her own arms. That's to say that I have a right to own, you know, bear and own a gun, and you have the right to do so as well. And as might be imagined, there's considerable dispute about that. And even when people approach it with good intentions, trying to honestly go with what, you know, the amendment means, they can disagree with full integrity. And then, of course, if you throw politics and emotions into it, obviously it gets rather messy. Now, ambiguity can also defeat communication, as I mentioned, unintentionally. So, the idea basically is there are cases where people do it accidentally and unintentionally. In that case, you know, people are often willing to cooperate to solve that problem. Other cases, people are being intentionally ambiguous, in which case it can be a bit of a struggle. Now, there are a variety of flavors of ambiguity. The first one, <coughs> the first particular one, is what is known as semantical ambiguity. It comes from the term semantics, which roughly put, means meaning. Now, a semantic, the ambiguous term, is a ambiguous term or claim whose ambiguity is due to the ambiguity of a word or phrase in the claim. So to recap that again, if you get a claim, a sentence, etc., something that's ambiguous semantically, that's because there's a word or phrase that is two or more meanings, and it's not clear which is intended. For example, if someone says, Sally always chooses the right side. Now, right is, of course, ambiguous. It could mean, in this case, that she chooses the right side of something, in terms of, like, location, like the right side of the classroom. It could also mean that she chooses the morally right side, that is to say, the morally correct side, it could also be a political reference, that she always takes the side of the right, the conservative. So there's at least three meanings in that regard. And so in that case, the ambiguity rests on right, having at least three meanings. Another example, when people say things like, you know, kind of the lame jokes like, I know a little German, that could mean you, mean you know someone who's German, who is, you know, rather lacking in height. Or it could mean that you speak a little a little bit of the German language. Or another example, if someone says, you know, Uncle Bill does not use glasses, that could mean, of course, reading glasses or drinking glasses. So it could mean that, you know, his eyesight is good, so he doesn't have to, you know, wear glasses, or he just chooses not to. Or that when he drinks, he just drinks, say, right out of the, you know, jug or bottle or can or whatever. Now, the way to fix semantical ambiguity is pretty straightforward. Since the ambiguity arises because there's a particular word or phrase that is ambiguous, the way to fix it is simply swap out the word or phrase with one that is not ambiguous. For example, if we have the statement, Sally always chooses the right side, suppose we mean that Sally always chooses the morally correct side, that she's a virtuous person. We could you know, we, we say this as saying instead of Sally always chooses the right side, we could say Sally always chooses the morally correct side. Or if someone says, you know, I know a little German, a person could say, instead, I can speak a little German. Or if someone says, instead of saying Uncle Bill doesn't use glasses, you could say Uncle Bill does not use drinking glasses. So 
That's the way to defuse or correct semantical ambiguity. Take the word or phrase that is ambiguous, swap it out with something that is not. Now, a second flavor of ambiguity is what is known as grouping ambiguity. It's a type of semantical ambiguity in which it is unclear whether a claim refers to a group of things taken individually or collectively. For example, if someone says retail employees makes more than make more than doctors, oh, that's ambiguous because it could mean that an individual retail employee makes more than an individual doctor, which is most likely not true. If the claim is about, you know, collectively, if you took all the retail employees, added up all their salaries and all the doctors, then it's probably true. So although the doctors make many more times than what people say in retail or service make, if you add up all the many more people, the overall salary is probably higher. Another example, take the, the sentence, tigers eat more than people. Now, this can be looked at in the following way. It could mean that tigers eat more than people in the sense that an individual tiger eats more than a typical individual person which is, you know, true, because even though, you know, people can be pretty big, uh, tigers generally eat way more than the typical individual. Now, if we take it collectively, if you took all the stuff tigers ate and all the stuff people ate, obviously in this case, we eat more than they do, because there's billions of us and not many of them, and fewer every day. Of course, it also is ambiguous in the sense that you could take it as tigers eat more than people meaning they eat other things besides people, such as frosted flakes, because of course they're great. Now associated with grouping ambiguity are two classic fallacies. A fallacy is an argument in which the reasons given for a claim fail to justify or warrant accepting the claim. Another way to look at it is a fallacy is a mistake in reasoning, it's a bad argument. The premise being presented do not adequately support the conclusion. And we'll see much more of these in part two, which is devoted, at least two thirds of it, to these fallacies. Now, people often confuse fallacy and factual error. People often say things like, blah, 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 that's, that's a fallacy. What they mean is, that's a factual error. What's the difference? Well, a factual error means one is wrong about the facts. So if someone says, People think that insects won't eat, you know, cedar wood, but that's a fallacy. Well, that's not a fallacy at all. It's a, it'd be a factual error. So if insects really do eat cedar, that means that it's a factual error, not a fallacy. It's not a mistake in reasoning. It's just being wrong about the facts. But anyways, getting back to the two fallacies. The first one is what's known as the fallacy of division. And this occurs when a person thinks that what is true of a group of things collectively automatically or necessarily holds true of the things taken individually. Or in other words, a person uncritically assumes that because something is true of the whole, it must be true of the parts. Hence the name division, because you're dividing things. For example, remember um, you know, years and years ago when I was a student, I remember uh, you know, being outside the dorm when the, you know, the freshmen were moving in, and there was you know a new student and their their parent was there, and the parent said, Oh, look, little Billy, look how big your dorm is. You'll probably have a big room. And of course, it's a fallacy of division. The mere fact that the dorm building is big definitely does not entail the dorm rooms are big. In fact, they are generally not very big. Another example, if someone says, um, you know, sodium chloride may be safely eaten, which is true, it infers that therefore the parts, the chemical components that make that up may be safely eaten, uh, that'd be a mistake, because obviously sodium chloride is made up of you know, sodium, which is a, in, a metal, that if you were to put it in your mouth, it would react uh, to the, the water in your saliva and would ignite, which would be rather unpleasant. Also, chlorine, of course, other chlorides, are not something you'd want to eat just by itself, because it would be rather bad for you. So the fallacy of division, basically, the way to recognize that is someone uncritically infers that because something is true of the whole, it must be true of the parts. And again, it doesn't mean the person is making a factual error, because 
they may say something that's true. What's true of the whole might be true of the parts. But the mistake they're making is, is that they're uncritically assuming this, and that's the error in reasoning. The second fallacy is the fallacy of composition, and this kind of reverses things. This is to think what holds true of a group of things individually, automatically or necessarily, holds of true of the things taken collectively. In other words, it's to infer that what's true of the parts must therefore be true of the whole, without adequate justification. A good example of this occurs in sports. For example, you know, some years back, back when they first allowed pro players to play basketball in the Olympics, we thought for sure we were going to win, because we had the best players in the world, which is true. But of course, people who are familiar with team sports know the best team is not always made up of the best individual players. And as we found out in that, that first little adventure, although we did pretty well winning the silver, we did not win the gold. And so you could have great players, but as a team they might be lacking. Another example, uh, to use kind of a silly example I remember from my undergraduate days, uh, atoms are colorless, cats are made of atoms, therefore cats are colorless, which of course would be the fallacy of composition. So that takes us through semantical ambiguity and the subtype of grouping ambiguity. And next time we'll take a look at additional form of ambiguity, specifically looking at syntactical ambiguity.